Greetings to all of you. It's a privilege to be here with you this Sabbath. Appreciate the special music. Appreciate several people saying welcome home. However, I was a little bit disappointed, though, that Mr. Punch did not issue his usual invitation to sign the guest book. <laughs> <clears throat> I heard a joke the other day where this mother came into her son's bedroom, and she said, uh, you need to get out of bed and go to church. And the son said, uh, I'm not getting out of bed. I'm not going to church, and I'll give you two reasons why. They don't like me at church, and I don't like them. His mother stepped back, and she said, uh, you're going to go to church, and I'll give you two reasons. Number one, you're 59 years old. <laughs> and number two, you're the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to assure you, neither my wife nor my mother made me come to church today. <laughs> but it is a privilege to be here. <clears throat> Been away for a couple of weeks. Two weeks ago, my wife and I were up in Ohio. I had a chance to go back to my 50th high school reunion. And it was very interesting to uh, connect with people that I went to school with and to share lessons that we have learned over the last 50 years. It was really quite interesting. Past Sabbath, I uh, was up in uh, Virginia or West Virginia, I forget which, but we had a combined service for the Bluefield and the Bristol congregations on the Sabbath, and then we had a public lecture or a Tomorrow's World special presentation uh, in Roanoke, Virginia, <clears throat> very pretty area of the country. And I was able to drive up to Fredericksburg, visit with uh, one of our ministers and his wife up there. And driving back on Monday, came down through Charlottesville, which is on the eastern side of the Blue Ridge. And driving over the Blue Ridge towards Lexington, Kentucky, it started to rain. It came down pretty bad, or pretty heavy. And coming down 81 in the Shenandoah Valley, the trucks and the cars were just kicking up a lot of spray. It was hard to see. So I was driving by Lexington, Kentucky, and I thought, or Le Lexington, Virginia. <clears throat> I thought, I'll just get off the freeway and stop here for just a little bit, because Virginia Military Academy is located in Lexington and also Washington and Lee University. And I'd been to those campuses before, but I thought I'd just like to stop, because Robert E. Lee is actually buried in chapel at Washington and Lee University. So as it turned out, I walked through the chapel, uh, went to the bookstore, talked with a couple people, came out and the rain had stopped and had a nice drive, then back down to Charlotte, where I got back into the rain again. <laughs> but I wanted to introduce the sermon by just commenting a little bit about Washington and Lee University. It has a very interesting history. It was established as a little academy by French, by uh, Scotch-Irish Presbyterians in 1749, before the American Revolution. It was established to educate young men, uh, prepare them for life. George Washington made a donation to Washington and Lee University. It was actually, Washington, it was actually uh, I think it started out as Augusta Academy because it's in Augusta County up there. And then it became Liberty Hall uh, College, or Liberty Hall Academy. But after wa Washington donated about $20,000 to it, they changed the name to Washington University. Uh, or Washington College, actually. It struggled through the Civil War, barely stayed alive. And after the Civil War, it was almost broke. They only had 40 students. And the uh, board of directors realized we need to do something. So as it turned out, uh, Robert E. Lee's daughter was visiting some friends in Lexington, Virginia. Now, Lee had lost the war. He was not a very popular person. Some people viewed him as a traitor because he would not lead an army into Virginia against his own people. He was not in favor of the war. Uh, he felt that slavery was evil. He was actually offered 
the uh, head position in the Union Army before the war because he was considered by General Winfield Scott as the best soldier in America at that time. But he said, I can't lead an army into my own state and fight my own people. So he declined that, <clears throat> fought the Union for about four years. At the end of the war, he needed a job. In fact, his daughter was making some comments in Lexington to some friends of hers that my dad needs a job. So the trustees of Washington College decided to elect Lee president of the college. He had never been to the college before. He had never met these people. He considered the job offer for a period of time, a couple of weeks, and decided to take it. Now, he'd had some experience with colleges and universities because he'd been the superintendent of West Point for several years during a tour of duty. <clears throat> I picked up a book while I was there entitled Lee, The Last Years. He lived five years after the surrender at Appomattox. And during those five years, he was the president of Washington College. It was really interesting, the reading a little bit about him. He mentions that Lee saw the need to give students an education that would prepare them for post-war realities. In other words, they were living in a different world after the Civil War. And he sat down with the trustees the very first week he was there. And he said, let's look at what the needs are in the South. Let's look at the needs that we have to prepare for. And they made a list of a lot of the needs that they saw. They saw a shattered South that needed men to be able to design bridges, develop chemical compounds for fertilizers, restore railroads and canals, build buildings. He said, we've got to prepare for a different future. We've got to prepare for a different future. So he and the trustees, in a matter of weeks, developed a new and practical vision for Washington College. They revised the curriculum. They realized they needed money. He said, I'm not going to be a teacher because I'm not a good speaker. But he said, I can be an administrator. So they revised the curriculum, began doing things. The second year, instead of 40 students, they had 400 students. By the time he died, they had attracted funding and students from all over the United States. But their goal was to prepare for the future, to educate young men, to deal with the needs of the future. Now, why am I talking about this? Because, you know, as I was reading this past week about this and thinking about it, I noticed some very interesting parallels between what Lee did for these young people and for the university, and his hope was to rebuild a nation, to contribute something. In fact, there was one other quote I wanted to share with you, because he had a share of critics around the country. Some said he should be tried for treason, and he knew that accepting this job would bring a certain amount of notoriety to the college, and he didn't want to bring the wrong kind. So he had a bunch of critics. When he began to have success there, then people began offering him jobs with a lot of money which he refused. He said, I'm grateful, but I have a self-imposed task which I must accomplish. I have led the young men of the South into battle, and I've seen many of them die on the field. But I shall devote my remaining energies to training young men to do their duty in life. You know, he and the trustees of Washington College <clears throat> looked at the needs that they were going to have to face in the next several decades. You and I have been called into a church by God to help change the future. We can look around and see the needs around us. We see a nation going down the tubes. We see morals plunging. We see the environment being destroyed. We see the influence of religion fading from the scene. 
We see a lot of problems today. Millions of people suffering and dying from disease around the world. Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up a government on this earth. He's going to need a group of people that can literally turn the world right side up. And we've been called to prepare to do that. Just as Robert E. Lee tried to mold the future by educating young people, we've been called into a church where God is molding and fashioning us to literally change the future, move people in a totally different direction. Notice, if you would, in Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> the scripture we've used from time to time. But it describes what God is going to be doing through a group of people. In Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, it's a prophecy about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is a type of an individual or an organization that will come at the end of the age and do certain things. Speaking of John the Baptist, it says, He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, which is really part of our job. You know, why are we preaching the gospel on television and holding these Tomorrow's World lectures, special presentations, is to turn people to God. Verse 17, he will go before him, that is John the Baptist will go before him, Jesus Christ. And again, there's an analogy here. Someone else, some other organization is going to be proceeding and preparing the way for Jesus Christ as we approach the end of the age. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, as it mentions in Malachi chapter 4. An emphasis on the family, which is something we need to be doing today too, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just or the rebellious, which really describes many people in America, in the Western world today, rebelling against the laws of God. And to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know, we've been called to prepare a people. That's why we've had the Bible study course. That's why we've had spokesman's clubs. That's why we do Bible studies and services. That's why we established Living University. To prepare a people to do what? Revelation 5.10, to become kings and priests, civil and religious leaders in the coming kingdom of God. We've not been called into the church just to kind of sit here, but to prepare to reign with Jesus Christ on this earth as teachers and as leaders. In Acts chapter 3, one other scripture just to look at. You know, what is coming down the road? What do we need to be preparing for? I mean, just as Robert E. Lee was preparing young people to rebuild part of the country that had been totally destroyed. You know, every time I drive up towards Washington, D.C., I'm just amazed that I read a number of books on the Civil War before I came to Mississippi. I wanted to get an education before I came down there to go to graduate school. <laughs> but I read about these battles. But when you drive up through northern Virginia, most of the battles were fought right around northern Virginia, strategic ones. Richmond, down to Atlanta, Chancellorsville, Battle of the Wilderness, a uh, number of other places up there. But the, the distance is just not that far. Manassas, just west of Washington, D.C. Several battles fought there. It was all fought in that area, and the areas were destroyed. Farms were destroyed. Bridges were destroyed. Fa uh, factories, whatever factories were there, not that many. But it was just torn up. Over 600,000 men died in the Civil War. It was horrible. And this was the, what Lee saw looking around. He said, we've got to change this. We've got to prepare for a future. We've got to prepare young men to begin to rebuild everything. So he had a goal. He had a purpose. 
The Bible tells us what our purpose is going to be in Acts chapter 3. Mr. Armstrong used to say these are some of the most pivotal scriptures in the Bible because it describes an incredible event that's coming and that we can prepare for. Verse 19 says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The time is coming in the future, maybe not that far into the future, when there's going to be a refreshing, a restoring. That he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you. Now Christ is going to come back with his saints. You read that in Daniel chapter 7. Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. There's going to be a restoring of the truth a restoring of God's way of life on this earth that human beings have rejected, been deceived about. This time of restoration, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. We're going to read some of those prophecies today in the sermon. Since the world began. What I want to talk about today in the sermon is one aspect of restoration that's going to take place that we can prepare for now. I want to talk about what the Bible says about health. And this has been my background for 20 or 30 years or longer. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that today. What does the Bible actually say about health? Why does God say these things in the Bible? What does he say, but why does he say these things? Why does he record this information in the Bible? And how does, the, how does what God say in the, says in the Bible, how does that differ from what medical science says today and what religion says today about these ideas? I want to focus on that today in the sermon because, brethren, millions of people around the world are suffering and dying from diseases, many of which can be prevented by some very simple actions. The biblical approach is very different from the modern medical approach today. I want to talk about these things because we are going to be involved in impacting the peoples of this world by teaching fundamental principles that we need to understand. They're not that difficult, but there's been an awful lot of confusion and controversy about these ideas. Here's just a quick example. There was a television evangelist some months ago, gave a sermon to his congregation, and then that was broadcast to whoever was watching. And then this little segment got on the internet, and he was saying, my wife and I have started to follow the biblical dietary laws. And we just find this wonderful. And he was urging his congregation to follow their example. And then you move around on the dials and you'll find other preachers saying, don't you ever do that. You know, Jesus liberated us from those laws. You know, you need to follow us. We know what we're talking about. So you've got both ends of the spectrum. And yet, brethren, we need to be able to explain what the truth is, why these principles are there, the benefits of those things and how this approach in the Bible differs from the approach of the world and from the approach of many modern preachers today. So I want to talk about that a little bit in the sermon that we have this afternoon. I'd like to ask, first of all, why do we find these health principles, laws of health in the Bible? Why are they there? Because many people are told today that they're irrelevant today. That's all Old Covenant, Old Testament stuff. We don't need it. You've been liberated from these things. But why did God put these things in the Bible in the first place? Turn back quickly to Exodus. <clears throat> Again, we're not going to go through a lot of scriptures today, but we need to think about what is there and begin to understand why it's there. In Exodus chapter 15, now God is talking to the generation of Israelites that he brought out of Egypt, that he delivered out of Egypt. 
And he told them here in Exodus chapter 15, a principle, verse 26. Now notice what he's saying. Here, just as in the opening prayer, uh, the request was made to help us uh, gain weight spiritually. <laughs> Very carefully chosen words. <laughs> to gain weight spiritually. Now we do that by studying the Bible. We want to lose weight physically. <laughs> but we want to gain it spiritually. We want to become spiritual heavyweights, not the physical heavyweights. <clears throat> but notice what God is saying. Again, a choice of words. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight and give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals. Now many people think that God just walks around and throws diseases at people. And you just innocently catch it. But it doesn't operate that way. What God is saying is if you obey, if you obey my laws and principles, then you can avoid a lot of things. Now, in some cases, God didn't bring disease supernaturally on people. It just happened. But in other cases, he allows us to reap what we sow. He allows us to reap what we sow. We reap the consequences. There is a cause and there is an effect, and we need to understand the two. But God is giving the parents, the, the first generation of Israelites coming out of Egypt, this basic principle. Now, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, now, this is after the first generation had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because they didn't obey God. And just prior to the second generation, the children of the Israelites that came out of Egypt, the children, just before they went into the promised land, Moses is reiterating these instructions. He said, you saw what happened to your mom and dad. Now, let me tell you, when you go into the promised land, Think about these things. I'd encourage you to read the first 10 verses of chapter 4, but notice in verse 1. Now, O Israel, you second generation, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe that you may live, that your life is going to be healthy, it's going to be worthwhile, it's going to be successful, and go in and possess the land which the Lord is giving to your uh, of your fathers is giving to you. Don't add to the word that I'm commanding you and don't take away from it. Now the health laws and health instructions we're going to be reading about, you know, modern Christians are basically, oh, they're not important anymore. We've been liberated. We, we can kind of X those out. We don't need to follow those anymore. But that's not what God was telling this generation of Israelites. Now, he told them this for a specific reason. Don't add, don't take away. Just do what I'm asking you to do. Verse 6, Therefore be careful to observe these laws, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this, is a great, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. God wanted people to see that there are consequences when you break certain laws. And there are benefits if you obey those laws. And he wanted the world to see that. He wanted the Israelites to be a light and an example to the world. That's why these instructions are there. Verse 7, for what great nation is there that has God so near to it? You know, they, they've got a God that is a loving God, that is a wise God. That was the reaction God wanted to see from other nations as they saw the example. And what nation is there that has statutes and righteous judgments as in all the law which I've set before you? you know, there's something that sets them apart, that makes them special. It's a way of life. Verse 9, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart teach these things to your children, to your kids, and to your children. <laughs> I'm poking fun here at Mr. Ames. <laughs> 
you know, God wanted the parents to teach their children these things so that the kids would benefit, the children would benefit <laughs> from learning this way of life. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now notice the repetition of some things we've already heard and seen. He's telling the Israelites here, don't be following idols like others have done. And don't get involved with other pagan nations because they're going to turn you away from following my laws. Verse 6, he says, for you are a holy people to the Lord. God has called you. He's got a special role for you to play. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself a special treasure above all the peoples of the earth. Now he tells them too, you're not any better than anybody else. Verse 7, the Lord did not set his love on you or chose you because you were more in number than any of the other peoples for you were the least of all peoples. You, know, you were in slavery. And God determined, I'm going, to, I'm going to use you as an example if you follow my instructions. Down in verse 12, Verse 11, notice there, it says, Therefore you shall keep the commandments and statutes and judgments which I command you to observe this day. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments, and you keep and do them, that the Lord will keep uh, with you the covenant, the agreement that he'd made with you. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. Verse 14, You shall be blessed above all peoples, there shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt, which you have known. And all this was based on obeying the commandments of God. He said, if you do these things, you're going to be blessed. You're not going to experience the consequences. God gave these laws to the Israelites to set them apart from the world so that they could be an example of a way of life that worked, that brought health, that brought happiness, that brought success. That was the purpose of these laws that God gave to the Israelites, not to punish them, not to humiliate them, but that they would be blessed as a result. And he wanted them to be a light and an example to the world. Okay, let's look at some of the, the instructions that are here. And we'll go through this relatively quickly, but, uh, you know, we publish articles on this. We've preached sermons in the past. Uh, so there's plenty of material that you can consult that we have uh, uh, put together over the years. But in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, these are two of the more uh, unique instructions that we find in the Bible. It talks about clean and unclean meats. Things that God said you can eat and things that God said not to eat. Now, most of you are familiar with this, but we also have newer people here that you know, we need to review some of these things from time to time. But God categorizes animals. He says clean animals in verse 3, uh, have cloven hoofs, they divide the hoof, and they chew the cud. These are ruminant animals. Cattle, deer, antelope, giraffe. They chew the cud, they divide the hoof. And he said, these animals you can eat. But animals that don't chew the cud and don't divide the hoofs, in many cases he's talking about carnivores, predator animals, he said, you're not supposed to eat those things. And he says the same thing then in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 14. Talking about fish, he says those creatures that live in the sea that have fins and scales you can eat. But if they don't have fins and scales, you're not supposed to eat them. And unclean, anim or unclean aquatic animals then would be clams and oysters, you know, that sit in the bottom of, the, of the estuaries and just suck up everything that comes by. You know. <laughs> And that includes bacteria, viruses, heavy metals, and they concentrate these things in their tissues. And then we eat them raw. <clears throat> and then chase it with some beer or alcohol to kill anything that might have gotten down there. <laughs> you know, but people today think they've been liberated from all these laws that inhibit us from enjoying whatever we would like to eat. 
I've used this example before. We've written about it. You know, normally, for dinner, you wouldn't go into your uh, vacuum cleaner and get the vacuum cleaner bag out and dump it on a plate and say, enjoy. <laughs> but that's what clams and oysters do. They were designed to purify water. God created them. They're good in what they're designed to do. You know, clean and unclean animals, for example. Uh, you've got scavenger animals, and God says, don't eat those things. They don't divide the hoof. They don't chew the cud. And that would be dogs. That would be uh, some of these African animals. Uh, I forget the name right now that uh, eat dead animals. You know, God said, don't eat those things. There's a different purpose. There's a different purpose. So God, in his wisdom, gave these instructions thousands of years before anybody had microscopes, before they knew what some of the consequences were. He was giving these instructions to the Israelites to set them apart, literally, to enable them to be healthy. And yet people today don't even seem to understand these basic things because knowledge has been lost. You know, in Erdman's Bible uh, handbook, under Leviticus chapter 11. I have a whole section here, a big chunk of a page, talking about clean and unclean animals. Now, this is not what many Protestant preachers use as the source of their preaching, but the knowledge is available. An article here in Erdman's Bible Handbook, it says, the lists of clean and unclean animals in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, have a significance often ignored often ignored, far from being a catalog of food taboos based on fad or fancy. These lists emphasize the fact, not discovered until late in the last century, and still not generally known, that these animals carry diseases dangerous to human beings. So there are biblical writers that understand there's something to these Bible laws, these Bible health laws. You know, whenever there's flooding somewhere near the coast and the sewers overflow, and then that water flows down into the bay, generally they close the shellfish beds. So you, you can't get clams and oysters out of the bay until all of this stuff kind of washes out to sea because those little creatures are down there sucking up everything that comes along. E. coli bacteria, typhoid bacteria, and other things. And God says, just don't eat them, then you won't have the problem. But in many parts of the world, these are not only delicacies, but they're part of the staple foods that people eat. Because if you live near a river, you live near the coast, these things are there plentiful, they're cheap, they grow in the ocean. So people harvest them, they sell them, they make money, and they eat them. And then they have to reap the consequences sometimes. See, God is a loving God. He said, I've created some things for you to eat, other things not to eat. And I want you to be healthy. In uh, <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 3 and chapter 7, a couple of quick verses here. Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17. <clears throat> so this will be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all your dwellings. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. So we're not to be eating blood products. You know, my... Mom and dad's family were Germans in uh, eastern Pennsylvania. My uncle usually butchered a couple cows every year. He had a farm. And he butchered a couple pigs, made blood sausage, uh, made bacon, liver pudding, a <laughs> bunch of other stuff, uh, because the pigs are cheap. But God says don't eat these things because they contain parasites. And the Bible doesn't tell us that, but medical science does. You know, there's a pork tapeworm, there's a beef tapeworm, there's a sheep tapeworm. You can kill those tapeworms, or the, the eggs anyways, by cooking. But what's interesting, I remember running into this in graduate school 30-some years ago. A pork tapeworm, uh, excuse me, a beef tapeworm, a sheep tapeworm, and a fish tapeworm stays in, in the intestines. A pork tapeworm starts out in the intestine, and then the larva can migrate through the walls of the intestine, gets into the bloodstream, and gets up into your brain. But the other ones don't. It's just the pork tapeworm that does that. See, guys, don't eat these things, and there are reasons for that. 
But we're told not to eat fat or blood. You know, high fat diets contribute to heart disease, stroke, diabetes, various types of cancer. High fat diets are, are a problem that we've discovered in the last 20, 30 years. And the Bible says don't eat. And it's talking about visible fat. I remember I had an aunt. Uh, we used to go to her house sometimes on Christmas or on Thanksgiving. And she would cook up uh, usually some ham and some chicken or turkey or something. And towards the end of the meal, she would kind of look around. And if anybody cut the fat off and had it on the edge of the plate, she said, give me that. Give me that. That tastes good. And she would eat it. And she died of some complications, but her husband died of cancer because this was the kind of food that she served. But she didn't understand these basic principles because it wasn't taught in the church that she attended. And for those of you coming out of other church organizations, I doubt seriously if you've heard sermons about these things. It's just not talked about that much because Jesus has liberated us from all these laws that God designed really for our benefit. Leviticus 7, so this is repeated. Leviticus chapter 7. Verse 23. <clears throat> so speak to the children of Israel, you shall eat no, uh, you shall not eat fat of ox or sheep or goat. Again, applying this in terms of principle, if you look at... Uh, the content, for example, of um, um, various meat products, the content of hot dogs, the content of hamburger meat, the content of uh, various ground meats like that. Here, your cheaper meats have about 40, 50 percent fat. They just grind the fat up with the meat. You got to spend more money to get lean meat. What's interesting here also is that for a gram of fat, contains twice as many calories as a gram of protein or a gram of carbohydrate. So high-fat diets are high-calorie diets, and high-calorie diets make deposits, <laughs> which are not the kind of deposits that we want. You know, so recognizing sources of fat. It could be visible fat on cuts of meat or fat that's been added to meat, or it could be all kinds of dressings and so on that we put on our salads to keep us healthy. <laughs> but if it's buried under all kinds of oils and other things, we're adding tons of calories. You go to Ryan's or some of these... Uh, these cafeteria type restaurants and watch the people walk away from the salad bar. You can't see the salad <laughs> with everything that's on top of it. Your cheeses and, and dressings and all this and that. And you watch how they walk away from the salad or from the dessert table three times. <laughs> and I just look around and notice they're not spiritual heavyweights. But they are heavyweights. <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to persecute anybody. I'm just saying these are instructions that God gave to the Israelites 3,500 years ago. He said, don't eat fat, don't eat blood. Again, my German uh, family members, Germanic family members, ate various blood products. In Africa, some of the tribes down there will mix blood with milk because there's protein in the blood. But whenever you get it straight out of a vein in the cow's neck, there's no filters, nothing. So whatever happens to be floating around in that cow, the cow could have been bit by a tetsy fly or something else, and these things, uh, the uh, larva in the blood, the bloodstream, God said, don't eat these things. For your benefit, for your health, don't eat these things. So the Bible talks about not eating fat or blood, but it took uh, medical science into the 1950s or 1960s to realize that uh, uh, you know, high-fat diets are a problem. But if, if the preachers had been doing their job and understood what the Scriptures say, they didn't need to understand biology necessarily. If they merely understood the Scriptures and believed what was there, they could have prevented a lot of problems. 
let's move on. Leviticus chapter uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. You might want to just skim through those chapters on your own. But Leviticus 11 not only talks about uh, clean and unclean animals. In verse 32, it says, if anything dead falls into a, uh, an item of wood, say a, a bowl, or it falls on clothing, uh, that item of either wood or a clay pot or something or, or clothing, he said it's unclean until even because something that's dead will have bacteria on it. And if it touches something by contact, it'll contaminate something. So God says if something dead falls uh, in a bowl of water or on a, a piece of clothing, it's unclean because you can pick up an infection from that. Uh, Talks about uh, childbirth here, rituals after childbirth in chapter 12. Now, these are all public health principles that are very powerful if they're applied. They do nothing if they're not applied. And I think part of our job in the coming kingdom of God is going to begin to explain why these things are in the Bible, why they're there, the wisdom and the love behind it. Mentions here, if you have a uh, boy baby that the mother is unclean for 40 days, if uh, she bears a female child, then she's unclean for 80 days. Now, this doesn't, doesn't mean in the sense that you're unclean, you're despicable, you're bad. <laughs> what it means is you're not to be around crowds. You're not to be around uh, large numbers of people. Uh, you're to be taken care of. <laughs> you don't have to do a whole lot of housework. <laughs> You don't have to do a lot of things like that. You're, you're to be protected. You're to have time to spend with your little baby. Now, in general, girl babies are born with lower birth weights than boy babies, and they're more susceptible to things. Not always, but in general. So what God is saying is keep this little girl baby home, bond with the baby, let the baby grow, let its immune system develop, and we're talking here about uh, 80 days, a little over two months. Uh, just don't be around large numbers of people. It's, a, it's an instruction for love. It's, it's not some uh, thing that's going to be bad for you. So these are instructions that we find in the Bible. You know, and generally we've said just don't, don't bring your little baby to church for the first month or so. We've been kind of general on that. Uh, but the reason is not to keep you away from church. Again, sometimes we feel like, well, I've got to be a church. <laughs> well, we need to think of somebody else besides ourselves. We need to think of the child and let that child grow and develop and strengthen. It's not some male chauvinist thing here. You know, girls have to stay away longer than boys do. It's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. In general, little girls are born with lower birth weight and they're more susceptible to things. They need more time to grow and of course, it's not true for every little girl. And some are already very robust as little baby girls. <laughs> but it's a general principle. It's a general principle. In uh, Leviticus 13, we find this quarantine principle. If somebody comes down with a sickness, they're to be uh, quarantined. You stay home. So this comes up every once in a while at the feast. The people feel that, well, I'm at the feast. I've got to go to church. <coughs> I've got to go. <coughs> Because God commands me to be there. <laughs> so we spread all these germs all around. No, we're to stay home. Maybe listen to some tapes or read, read your Bible. But, you know, backing it up even before that, you don't push yourself to the point where you're totally exhausted before you leave for the feast, where you then come down with something before you leave. We've got to think ahead. We've got to plan ahead. Uh, you know, get enough rest. Don't overeat. You know, I've used this example, the first feast I ever went to. I heard the instructions that uh, for spending second tithe, you can go to the feast and spend your money for whatever your heart desires. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I didn't have that much money to spend, but <laughs> I had a lot of desires. <laughs> Which included steak and eggs for breakfast, steak for lunch, steak for dinner, and then we went out to dinner after service. <laughs> And I came home sicker than a dog because my body couldn't take it. 
and you, you mix that together with staying up late and talking with everybody and losing sleep. I remember getting home and I, I think I was sick for two weeks. And my mom's conclusion was, this must be some church. <laughs> you starve yourself all year, then you go to the feast and you blow everything out, and then you come home sicker than a dog. This is some religion. <laughs> you know, I wasn't setting the example that God wanted, but I thought I was doing the right thing because I was spending my second tithe for whatever my heart desired. <laughs> But I hadn't learned to apply these principles properly. You know, so God gives us principles, but our challenge is to learn to apply these things. The quarantine, you're staying home for, uh, whenever you're sick. You know, it's interesting how history kind of plays games on this. The, during the outbreaks of the bubonic plague in the Middle Ages, the Jews did not experience the severity of the plague that many other people did. And then they were accused of causing the plague <laughs> because they weren't having the problems. But it was principles of quarantine and other biblical principles we find in the Bible that protected them. And then they were persecuted for it. This is how the world looks at the instructions that God has given us. Uh, Leviticus 15 talks about discharges from the body, you know, bleeding or uh, open wounds or something like that. And it mentions if any uh, fluid from any of these discharges touches anybody or anything, then that thing or the person is unclean. They, they, they're not to be associating with other people until they bathe because diseases are transmitted by contact. They're transmitted by contact. And the Bible says you don't have contact with people until you wash uh, or you're cleaned up. <clears throat> So these are a number of the principles found in the Bible. Let me just mention a couple of other ones. Genesis 17, God used circumcision of males to be a sign of the covenant, the agreement that he was making with Abraham. Now people today, some people feel that you know, circumcising little boys is barbaric because they cry. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> they grumble. Messes up their digestive tract. Does a lot of things. But God says do it. Partly it was to set them apart, but we've found, again, medical science has found over the years that women that are married to men that are circumcised have lower rates of cervical cancer. Now, these are not real dramatic things, but there are uh, significant differences. Little boys that are circumcised have uh, lower rates of urinary tract infections. And they're finding also that... Uh, Circumcision appears to prevent or reduce the incidence or the transmission of HIV viruses. So there are a number of benefits that are there, and yet I think we've even had people in the church, I'm not going to get my little boy circumcised because, you know, that's barbaric. No, there is wisdom and love behind these things, behind these instructions. And again, male circumcision is a totally different thing from female circumcision is practiced in some parts of the world, which is really mutila uh, mutilation of the body. So these principles are there. Deuteronomy 23, <clears throat> verses 9 through 14, talks about burying human excrement because this is the way you break up the transmission of, of parasitic diseases. I remember years ago, we had a feast site up at Saratoga Sp Springs in New York. There's a fort up there <clears throat> where during the Revolutionary War, they had four or 5,000 men around there to fight the British. And the guide that was taking us through the fort, he said there were more men died up here from disease than died in the military engagements. They died of typhoid fever. They died of a bunch of other diseases that were due to human excrement and garbage laying around where you got 5,000 people living. If you've traveled through a number of countries outside of what I would call Israelite countries around the world, you'll, you'll see dead animals laying in a ditch. Uh, I remember once in Tanzania, we were out in western, actually western Kenya, a little village by a lake, and uh, <clears throat> there was a little marketplace there where the fishermen would sell their goods and other people would bring, uh, would bring vegetables and so on down, lay them on tables, 
And I was just looking around, and the water that was coming down a little drain came right through the town, right through this area where the marketplace was. And you looked at the water, and it was blue. And there was stuff floating in it I won't identify. And some dead animals laying around. And then people were, some kids were coming on their bicycles down to the water edge, just where this little stream was coming in, and getting plastic bottles and filling them up with water. They would take them back to either drink or wash with. Now, they didn't understand some of these basic principles. I remember years ago watching uh, <clears throat> some slides that one of the medical doctors at the University of Mississippi had taken. He'd taken a trip through Southeast Asia. Uh, and some of the canals through some of those cities down there. And they had guys in little canoes uh, serving vegetables out of their little canoe. And whenever they were done serving out of this dish, they kept the dish, reached over into the water, washed it off, and you saw dead things floating down the water. And, you know, the Bible says you bury dead things. You bury excrement. You, 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 you bury it underneath the ground so that flies don't get on it, and then they come up and crawl over your face. I don't want to make anybody sick, but, <laughs> but this is what happens. My wife and I spent uh, about, I don't know, five weeks in Jordan a number of years ago. And we were on an archaeological dig, and we were using a little school uh, as a dormitory and as a kitchen and as a dining room. And there were no screens on the kitchen, the room that they used for a kitchen, and we also ate uh, breakfast and lunch and dinner there. So there was always flies all over the place. So you ate with one hand and you kept this other hand moving <laughs> to keep the flies off of you and off of your food. Now just outside the window, there was a bunch of sheep droppings. <laughs> mm. And the flies were out there one minute and they were in crawling over you and the food, you know, for the rest of the time. And part of my job there that summer was to make some screens for the window to keep the flies on the outside to hopefully protect the health of the students and everybody else that was there. But most people didn't have screens because they couldn't afford screens. I think in some cases probably didn't understand why we needed screens. But see, what God is saying here, you bury this type of thing. You don't throw it into uh, uh, waters. In fact, if you travel around Europe, Many of the castles that were built had a little ledge that projected out over a stream. And that ledge had holes in it where people sat. <laughs> and that was how they got rid of their uh, waste. But it just went downstream. And whoever was downstream from that was exposed to all kinds of disease organisms because the principle wasn't understood. They had big cathedrals. They had priests walking around with big hats and sprinkling holy water on everybody. But they weren't preaching these things. They weren't preaching practical principles that would prevent many, many problems. You know, maybe you know, as we're going through this, you can begin to appreciate what was mentioned here in this Erdman's Bible Handbook that made this statement, these lists of clean and unclean animals and these other principles we could add uh, <clears throat> have a significance that's often ignored. Far from being a catalog of food taboos based on fat or fancy, these lists contain, uh, emphasize a fact not discovered until the last century and still generally not known that animals carry diseases for human beings. The Bible, God has inspired it for our benefit to help us live long, successful, and healthy lives. Deuteronomy 14, it mentions there that you can go to the feast, spend some of your money for a little bit of wine or strong drink. It doesn't say go to the feast and get drunk. You're to rejoice before the Lord. It's interesting, Robert E. Lee grew up in Tidewater area of Virginia, in the aristocracy of Virginia. And they danced, they had wine with meals, and they had a little bit of something after dinner. <laughs> but when he was hired by these Scotch-Irish Presbyterians up in uh, Lexington, they didn't dance, and they didn't drink. So he had adjustments that he had to make. <clears throat> 
in 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul is telling members of the early church, he said, you can take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your oft infirmities. In other words, God knew and inspired Paul to write that a little bit of wine is, is okay. I didn't say a couple of bottles after dinner. <laughs> he said a little bit, a little bit. And they found that a little bit of wine actually elevates uh, HDL levels, which is good. But again, too much, you can wind up being an alcoholic and die of cirrhosis of the liver. So there's balance in all these things. Proverbs 25, let's notice there quickly. <clears throat> Proverbs 25. See, these principles are actually sprinkled through the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament, writings of Moses, writings of Solomon. Proverbs 25, verse 16 says, Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomited it up. Verse 27, It's not good to eat much honey. You know, so the Bible is saying here in terms of a principle, when it comes to refined uh, sugars or sweets, a little bit is okay, but don't do too much because there'll be consequences. You know, when I first came into the church, people were saying, oh, you need to eat honey and not sugar and stuff like that. So every night before I go to bed, I have this big tablespoon full of honey, which is not really wise. You, you have this great big tablespoon of spoonful of honey and what you're doing to your pancreas is just slapping it and let's go with a shot of insulin. And you do that too many times, you wear out your pancreas. And then you wind up with, with blood sugar problems. See, we, we've got to live within the physical laws that God designed our body to operate. And what we're finding here is a principle. Honey, it's good, but use it sparingly, not in big gulps. Sometimes we think if a little bit is good, then a lot of it's better. No. <laughs> Again, hopefully I'm preaching to the choir, but part of our job, brethren, is going to be explain these simple principles to people that are literally going to change their life. Uh, <clears throat> First Timothy 4, verse 8. Let's turn there. Because this verse has been used and abused and misread and misapplied. First Timothy chapter 4 <clears throat> and verse 8. <clears throat> it says for body excellent bodily exercise profits a little but godliness is profitable in all things now keep in mind paul is writing this uh, during the days of the roman empire and if you visited any Roman cities, they've got baths where you could exercise and hot water baths and cold water baths and exercise rooms, health clubs. So it was kind of a health culture in that sense. Many people were into that in a big way. But Paul is saying bodily exercise profits, but godliness is profitable for all things. If you look up a number of different translations, what Paul is saying is bodily exercise profits for a little while. It's temporary. It may take you 30 days to get in shape, but if you don't exercise for 30 days, you'll lose it all. In fact, you'll start losing in about a week. It's something you've got to stay with in a balanced way. Exercise helps reduce cholesterol levels. It, uh, it sharpens us mentally. It keeps our body active. Uh, there's a lot of benefits, but they're temporary. And we should still strive to stay fit, but at the same time, Stay spiritually fit is what's really important in the long haul. So the Bible is not putting down exercise. It's just saying it's temporary. It has a temporary benefit, which we need physically. We need those benefits. You know, if you look at Jesus' life, he said, follow me. Jesus went up from Nazareth to Jerusalem at least three times a year for the holy days. It's about 75 miles one way. So if he went up three times a year, that's 150 miles round trip times three, which is 450 miles a year. That's a bit more than most of us walk. <laughs> 
to do, and then he was, a, he was a carpenter, but he worked with stone, he worked with wood, without power tools. How long does it take to saw a log? Half an hour, maybe? He, he was a physically active individual. You know, he wasn't sitting in a monastery up on top of a mountain somewhere. He was physically active, and he said, follow me. You know, so the instruction is there, the example is there. In terms of mental health, it's interesting where God placed human beings when he created them. He didn't put them in a high-rise in downtown Rome. He didn't put them in a monastery. He put them in a garden where there was running water, where there was contact with animals, where you could see the sun come up and the sun go down, where you could hear the birds. You know, they found in medical studies that people, patients in hospitals, if they look out and see a brick wall or they see a neon sign, they don't get better as quickly as people who look out a window and see trees and see a waterfall. There's something that contact with nature, contact with God's creation does to us. You know, David talks about in the Psalms, he says, I look under the hills from whence comes my strength. He kind of asks the question, but... You know, being out in uh, a countryside, one of Robert E. Lee's daily habits, he woke up at 7, had breakfast at, uh, I think, 7 or 7.30, went to chapel about quarter of 8, and he was in his office from 8 until 2. Then he ate lunch, took a little nap, and then went for a couple of hours ride on his horse out through the countryside to just, he said, to clear his mind to clear his mind. We go home and watch television. It's a different lifestyle, different lifestyle. But God placed human beings in a garden. Jesus Christ grew up in the hills around Nazareth, not in a big city. I think it's going to be interesting as we have opportunities to design places for human beings to live in the, in the kingdom of God. We need to be putting some of these things in our mind, put them on the shelf, how we're going to implement things. Reading Psalm 23, go home and read that. And David is talking about walking beside the still waters. He said, it restores my soul. When you go to the feast this year, try and find some place that's quiet. If you're by the ocean or near the hills or whatever, and just sit down and think about why am I at the feast? What lessons can I learn? How can I go home and be different as a result of the feast? And come back with some goals. Plan some directions in your life. So ask another question. How do the Bible instructions differ from medical science today and also from many of the world's religions? If you read through these instructions that we've been talking about, you notice we're not talking about cures and treatments. We haven't been reading about that. We've been reading about principles that have to do with behavior. I remember reading in a book on history of medicine years ago whenever I was coming into the church. And the author pointed this out. He said, most ancient civilizations, whether they're the Indians in India, the Greeks, the Romans, whether they're the Aztecs or Mayans, they all have extensive lists of drugs and treatments. He said, you don't find that in the Bible. He said, the Hebrews were different. They had a, a, a few simple principles that the priests were used to use to educate people. In many cases, in these other civilizations, it was the priests that guarded these secrets because that was the source of their power. And yet it was the job of the Israelite priest to preach these things and explain. Don't eat fat or blood. Uh, don't eat unclean animals. Only eat these certain things over here. Quarantine sick people. They're not treatments. They're not cures. They were principles that promoted health and prevented disease. But that doesn't make anybody any money. That would put pharmaceutical companies out of business. I'm not saying that some medications may not be helpful. I'm just saying that the approach is very different. And it's the approach that we're going to be using 
because these principles influence policy. They influence policy. And if you tell people that you're not to eat clams or oysters, what does that do to lobster fishermen? And oyster fishermen, it's going to impact their jobs. They're going to have to be re-educated and reoriented. And you have to explain to them why you're reorienting them because they're not going to like it necessarily. Well, my father did this and my grandfather did this. And you're going to tell me to do something different? We have to say yes. Because there's a different way of life that we're going to be learning. One other principle I wanted to mention here in James chapter 5, because <clears throat> there are spiritual dimensions here. In James chapter 5, it mentions if somebody's sick among you, beginning in verse 14, Call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over them, anointing them with oil. In the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now, we do encourage people to look to God to intervene. In some cases, God intervenes dramatically. In other cases, it takes time. Um, it says, the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, sometimes we stop reading there. But there's another verse that says, confess your trespasses or your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And what this verse is basically saying is acknowledge. Acknowledge what you may have done that contributes to the problem. And then you repent of that. You change that. In some cases, you know, we can't go back and undo what we've done. But if we make the effort... I remember living in Ireland for about five years, and I developed what was called uh, um, senior moment here. I forget what it was. <laughs> acid reflux, where your stomach is real acid, and the, the stomach kind of, acids kind of get up into your esophagus, creates a burning feeling. And I think I was anointed for it, but it still stayed there. And then I started reading about the, the situation. And said there are various foods and things that contribute to the problem. Alcohol, chocolate, uh, tomato products. And that was my routine for a couple years. Have a little beer before dinner. Have lasagna. Then have some chocolate afterwards. <laughs> and then lay down instead of sitting up. And I couldn't figure out why this stuff wasn't going away. Until I read some of these things and realized, I'm doing to myself. <laughs> I'm creating a situation that I need to repent of and I need to change. You know, so if we realize verse 16 is still in the Bible. Now, this doesn't mean you walk around and tell everybody like I just did. <laughs> you know, what your problem is. But at least you acknowledge it and say, God, forgive me. Help me to change. Help me find out what I need to be doing. So this is another aspect. And again, we've published about these subjects of clean and unclean meats. We've preached sermons about these things for decades. The tragedy is, I think, that many preachers today are preaching a very different message. You know, this one preacher that I mentioned early in the sermon that he was telling people, you need to follow the example of my wife and I. We're not eating pork anymore. And then you go to other programs and they're saying, you know, we're liberated from all that. That's all old covenant. Those laws Jesus did away with. You need to follow us. We know what we're talking about. In one case, the preacher turned to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> and we need to understand some of these arguments. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to... Uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having their conscience seared with hot iron, forbidding to marry, promoting celibacy, and commanding to abstain from foods which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused and is received if it's received with thanksgiving. So see there, you can eat anything. Because this is what the Bible tells us. But we've got to put this in context. Paul is talking about ideas that are doctrines of demons. Are clean and unclean meats doctrines of demons? 
God inspired those instructions. He said, I'm telling you, you can eat certain things and you don't eat other things. Is quarantine a doctrine of demons? Is not eating fat or blood doctrines of demons? I mean, we need to ask these questions. Paul is talking about something totally different here. He's talking about speaking lies and hypocrisy, abstaining from foods. He's really talking about vegetarianism, some of these ideas that were promoted by Greek philosophers, that if you don't eat meat, you can be more spiritual. This is what he's talking about. Paul was addressing some of the same ideas in Colossians. And the Gnostics picked up some of these ideas. So you can be a lot more spiritual if you just don't eat certain things. Uh, ascetics, they're called. If it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer, where do you find clean or unclean animals sanctified, set apart and special in the Bible? You don't. Notice back in Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> because Paul was warning about some things. We don't normally apply this here in, in relative to health issues, but it certainly fits. <clears throat> Paul is talking about people that are preaching wrong ideas. Verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men who suppress the truth who hold back the truth, who try to tell you that there's no health reasons for these laws that we find in the Old Testament, that they were merely there to separate the Israelites from everybody else, but there's no health reasons. You know, when the Church of God split back in um, 1995, some of the young men that had taken over the Church of God were telling people those Old Testament laws have nothing to do with health. But they do. That's why they're there. If God said, you follow these things and you're going to be blessed and physical health will be part of the blessings. So people have held back the truth. They've withheld the truth from preaching to other people. Romans 8, 7 is another interesting principle to think about. <clears throat> Why do people argue against these health laws in the Bible? Why don't they want to follow them? Now, many people have bought this idea, well, Jesus did away with them. But why would Jesus do away with principles that have benefits to them? You know, the biological laws did not change when Christ died on the cross. Pigs still contain parasites. <laughs> it's still going to be dangerous to eat some of these things. None of those things changed. Why do people resent or why do people not want to follow these laws? Romans 8, 7, it says, The carnal mind, the unconverted mind, is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. If you've got an unconverted mind, you're going to argue with what's in the Bible and come up with all kinds of reasons why you don't have to do what's there. And we all need to kind of look at our minds in that sense. Okay, if we bring this to conclusion quickly, <clears throat> you know, we need to develop a very different attitude than Romans 8, 7 discusses. And that attitude is illustrated in one of the places in Psalm 119. You know, David is going to be king over all of Israel. God is going to use him to guide the... Uh, implementation of his laws in, in the government of God. But notice David's attitude towards the law of God. He was not trying to run away with, from it. He was not arguing with it. Psalm 119, I'd suggest you read the whole psalm when you go home. But notice in verse 1, this was David's attitude. Blessed are the undefiled or the blameless in the way who walk in the law of God. You walk in God's law, you're going to be blessed. Down in verse 12, blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. You know, show me the way you want me to go. Verse 16, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Verse 18, maybe draw a circle around that. Open my eyes that I may see the wondrous things from your law. You know, people have argued about these guidelines for little babies that we read in uh, Leviticus. 
you know, the idea that a woman has to stay home for 40 days if she has a little boy baby and then 80 days if she has a little girl. That's, 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 yeah, it's terrible. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, what's the word I want here? Uh, male chauvinism, you know, just treating women as second class citizens. No, when you understand the psychology behind it, the biology behind it, there's wisdom there. It says, God says, for your good. But if we have this attitude where David says here, open my eyes, help me see, God, why you've inspired certain laws and principles. We're going to grow. God's going to be able to use us. And what we're going to be doing in the coming kingdom of God, we read about in Isaiah chapter 2. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 2. <clears throat> God tells us what's coming down the road, and we can begin to prepare for these things. As young people, you can guide your education along certain directions. As older people, retired people, you can supplement your background and prepare for what's coming. Isaiah 2, verse 2, it says, It'll come to pass in the latter days, at the end of the age, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains. Christ is coming back to set up a government that's going to rule this earth. All nations will flow to it. And people will say, come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to Jerusalem, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, from Jerusalem, shall go forth the law. It's not been done away with. We're going to be teaching the laws of God, explaining the laws of God to people around the world. In Isaiah chapter 11, <clears throat> It mentions here in verse 9, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God is going to use his people to teach the world his way of life. Final scripture in Isaiah 30, verses 29, excuse me, verses 20 and 21. The latter part of verse 20, it says, But your eyes shall see your teachers, and your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. This is the way. Walk you in it. Brethren, God has called us to literally recapture true values. General Lee looked around in 1865 at a shattered world. Homes had been destroyed. Farms had been torn up. Bridges exploded. People in need. He sat down with these leaders of Washington College. He said, we've got to reshape the world. We've got to rebuild the world in which we're living. We have an opportunity to train young men, to point them in a different direction. And five years later, instead of 40 students, he had over 400. They were getting donations from rich people up in the north that were acknowledging what they had done in five short years of preparing people to make the world different. God has called us out of literally every walk of life. He's given us powerful principles in his word. And he's going to give us an opportunity to explain these principles in the coming kingdom of God in a way that's going to change people's lives for good and forever. That's what the Bible has to say about health.